there were young people who, in a way, couldn't be part of any other club. When it opened in the Manor of St. John, what was really good was there's no neighbours. Mm. So you had nobody going to complain. So it was a great spot to put a drop-in centre. And also there was an awful lot of youth unemployment in the area. So it was actually a really good location. So the idea was, you know, this would be a good place um, to provide what, well, apart from anything, was like a kind of safe house that, that they could come to. We've got absolutely nothing to do. Um, it, it's, it's boring, you start to lose your sense of yourself. Mm -hmm. So we, we occupy people's time. You know, there's a playing pool or playing cards or writing or drawing or artwork or music. We, it, was, it was full time, you know, mm -hmm. spending time doing something. There are no jobs. I got left go in 1983 from Arco, furniture factory on the estate. And it took me five years to get a job. There was nothing else in the area. You were only hanging around and you were getting to an age of 14, 15, 16. When you're hanging around, eh, idle hands make the devil's work. When you're going to have teenagers of that age and they're living in the, the economic climate they're in and everything and functionally there's nothing there for them, there's going to be a rise in crime. I was real wild when I was younger. Stealing cars, doing lots of stuff. I used to actually go over to the garage barracks and beat the horn and get them to come out. There were no money around. There were nothing. There were no jobs around. So everyone was robbing. You know what I mean? That's what you done. You got up in the morning, you went robbing. End of story. Before the club, you know, let's be honest with you, they were there with us, right? We, we found a way into Tesco's, but it would have been super quick at the time. Or yeah. super, or whatever, quick. Queen's Works. We Queen's found a way into the back shot, and we were so young, we took boxes of air. Uh, Buttons and boxes <laughs> and picnic bars. And it's a big thing there, you know what I mean? But yeah. oh, didn't we fucking hide them over the lawn? Obviously, you're not going to be holding a box that size, do you? Hide them over the lawn. Probably oh, yeah, two bars. Probably oh, fucking thousand bars there. But anyway, the last fellas come up and rob them. <laughs> and we went down and we couldn't find them. No, we don't. We burnt every ditch down there. <laughs> because we were angry, just sitting over there. And the last fellas ran up, yeah, they're burning all the chocolates. <laughs> You'll be down down lots of things, you know. <laughs> Sitting down smoking <laughs> fags, like, you know what I mean? Drinking beer, bumblers. <laughs> Double bumblers comes to mind and, and flags of cider and big glue sniffing, I think, went on. If there's one thing about the glue sniffers, did you all stick together? <laughs> it was pretty obvious to, to me that, you know, there, there was a need for something. Because no one had that. Yeah. <laughs> they did things with us that our parents didn't have time. Yeah and the money and the effort, mm. you know. Being exposed to another life, yeah. what our parents and that couldn't give us, because I wouldn't say that they didn't know how, it was just, it was, they were rare, they're safe in a, in a kind of deprived different areas, times, yeah, yeah. different times. Some of us had alcoholic parents, like, you know what mm. I mean, or I was reared by my grandparents, like, you know, right. that kind of way, so it was just great to get out of the house and away from it, like. It wasn't rosy. It was actually very kind of, uh, Gritty and quite a lot of damage was being done um, to other people and to themselves, I guess, at that time. We all fell through the cracks. Mm. Because back then you could leave school at 15. I was out of there, I tell you, I was gone. Oh, <laughs> I hated school. I left when I was 15. I should have stayed, but sure, I didn't. I've seen fellas getting put to the back of the class and going out the window. <laughs> and that's the truth. They'd be put down the back of the class and they'd be thinking, like, why am I here? Out the window they go. They concentrated on the really good ones and the ones that were on the peripheral were left there. The education system just did not meet the needs of those young people yeah. in any way, shape or form. A lot of us decided to join it and, and it was exactly that. It was a youth project, it was easy going. There was no one looking in detail at people coming into it. You might go up there in the morning or afternoon, game of table tennis, game of chess, game of cards, bit of a laugh. A couple of quirky individuals running as a Mark Roper, an English poet, an animal lover, Ollie Breslin, a cheesy vegetarian art guru <laughs> that we were all amazed by, that, that we took a long time to settle into, and I think it came from both sides. But then I think there was a mutual respect became there, because Mark Roper was exactly what he said he was on the page. He was an honest, interested in youth, into his poetry and his literature. I'm very much in that society as a whole, for the better, as was Ali Breslin, as current today, he's still involved. Most of the times we were very strict and um, 
because we wanted the place to be a safe place. When you came in the door, we wanted it to be safe. My job every day was to be a bouncer. I was on the door. And if anyone came to the door, I checked them before they came in. So I would kind of go uh, and I'd, I'd look at their pupils. Knock on the door, Ollie, open the door. You, 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 they're not coming in today. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, what's up? Look at your eyes. I seen you down behind the wall. <laughs> but the guards might come to the club and share the there and Ollie would say, you're not allowed in here. You're yeah. not coming in here. Yeah. And that's it. Now, he, now, it's not disrespect for the law. He'd be trying to look after the boys as well mm. and the law have no right to window without warrants or anything like that. And he just, mm. you're not coming in here. <laughs> Them boys are with me and that's it. You know, that was almost a justification in itself mm -hmm. to have a safe house mm -hmm. uh, where people wouldn't need to be fighting, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't need to be tough, but just could come in and would know that there were boundaries, you know, mm -hmm. um, and those boundaries were, were going to be enforced. It was a different dynamic from what we were used to. You know, we were allowed to express ourselves. We were cold if we got too boisterous. But not so much so that we weren't said, well, oh, this place. There would have been a lot more jail time, I reckon, you know what I mean? I reckon. And the people that were in it were good people. Mm -hmm. Bring in your own blast, then make tea in there. The pool table was there. Mm -hmm. Table tennis was there. There was arts there. There was always music there. And Johnny Foley's song was always on, Marianne Faithful. <laughs> and you weren't allowed to turn it off. And every night when you go to sleep, you could still hear the song in your ear. <laughs> but in relation to activities, basically the young people would elect to do things themselves, whatever. So if we said we're going to bring in someone to do drama, there might be, uh, there might be three or four fellas interested. Mm -hmm. But then there might be another four or five people put their name down to give it a go, see what it's like, you know what I mean? So there was all that kind of thing. People would kind of dip their toes in, maybe take little steps. But then if they found, for example, the same doing painting, some of the lads really liked it. So no matter who we got in to do painting, murals and all that kind of stuff, because the place was full of murals. Uh, we would definitely know people who wanted to do that. Uh, the Chronic, the newsletter, and lots of people, I think it was a Pat Kennedy, they used to write um, stories for it, but lots of people contributed stories and poems and, and all kinds of things to that. Right. And that was just a way, I suppose, that people got a chance to share the work they did. Yeah, we brought in some really interesting people from, in, from Waterford. I'm thinking of people like Ted O'Regan. Ted used to do drama with the lads and Ted, like, he was a much older man, uh, but he really, he was really kind of mad, you know what I mean? He was like really interesting man to meet. Uh, you'd never forget him. I didn't know what drama was. Yeah. You know, drama to me was someone having a fight in the pub. Ted, oh, I remember him, he sticks in my mind yes. a lot. He yeah. was very good, I wasn't actually he? did a play with him then yeah. afterwards, yeah. Oliver. Yeah. I'll never forget it, yeah. He instilled confidence in everybody who took part in his classes because we went on to do shows. What do you know, we got a show. Because yeah. <laughs> every other kind of, I think there was four, there was four um, clubs involved. The three, the other three had you know, the shiny shorts and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah. We had old duffel coats on us <laughs> and that was the whole thing about it. Yeah. That was, that was brilliant. Like Ted O'Regan, to me, was brilliant. Mam's a genius. I know they throw around, around the word genius nowadays. That's, you know, but he was yeah. genuine. And we could all go up there and pretend for five minutes or ten that we weren't ourselves. <laughs> you get me? Yeah. Take us out, take us out of our heads and yeah. we could act the ages and it wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. That was absolutely yeah. brilliant. Ted gave it confidence. Mm. He gave everyone confidence. Mm. That man was a brilliant man. They, they were able to bring out an awful lot of um, hidden stuff that you didn't know that you were yeah. able to play it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Hidden like, hands, you know I mean? like, yeah. I, I wouldn't have even dreamed of even trying to do any of that drawing stuff that was up there. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, like, I only ever drew, drew an art in school. Mm. But sure, like, when I was looking at the piece of things, like, you know, they were telling me they were leaving me off and stuff like that. Like, I was amazed to see what I was able to do. Because yeah. I didn't know I could do that. Especially not, uh, on, a, on a big scale, like, you know what I mean? You have a big wall. It's not just a sheet of paper that you draw yeah. this out on, yeah. like, you know what I mean? So they had to bring out that kind of talent that I never knew. They gave me the freedom to express yeah. yourself. Yeah. Either drawings or writing yeah. and the whole lot might have, you know what I mean? Mm. They put that belief in thing. Yeah. You can do it if you really want to, like, you know what yeah. I mean? Musicians, artists, writers, poets, um, an amazing amount of creativity um, that came to the fore, I suppose, when people were just looking for something to do. Right. Um, so it allowed them time to actually develop those talents as well. It's an incredible amount of creativity at the time. I'm Morrow, I'm from Nashville. You're, 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 You're from the Knock! You're from the Knock! We are not from He's from the Knock! Totally Connie's place! Connie's place! You're from the Knock!
Some do not. I wrote that one for my father when he died 13 years ago. You're gone now, Dad, to your rightful place. I can still see you now, I can still see your face. I'm the youngest of seven, I should have met you in heaven. From the start, you gave me life, you gave me heart. I miss you, Dad, we've never been about. So it's Billy or Elvis or even Bottom. <laughs> you give me the strength to keep going on. I hope I'm like you, Dad, when I grow old. So I can tell my children there's a story to be told. And that story is you, my father, my dad. You're the greatest friend that I ever had. Like, even like going on a trip canoeing, right? Yeah. I never went canoeing before. And then the club brought me canoe. And I remember going to Greg the Manor and every wheel I went down I fell out of the canoe. <laughs> and they brought us to Tramore then to the waves after that to learn us how to stay up in the wheels, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then when I went back to Greg the Manor the next time I was able to hold myself up. There are things that I learned that you wouldn't realise that you'd be learning. Yeah. You know. He went down off the side of the thing by a ten foot drop. <laughs> when the spray deck to stop the water fills so your canoe wouldn't fill up. And when he came back up out of the water there was a pool of water in his lap and there was a fish in it, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, that happened. It's true, I'm sitting here, that happened. I couldn't believe it. But brilliant times. We went ice skating up in Dublin one yeah. time, yeah? It was, it was, it was only a mock though, yeah? No, it was. It was real ice skating. It was real ice. It was real ice. It's cold. It's cold. We were sailing to rock climbing, canoeing, sea kayaking, you know, we've done it all, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. This is stuff that we would never got the opportunity to do. Right. If without, without that. The, the club learned us how to sail. I know I'm, I'm a, I done a recreational skipper's ticket. I can navigate boats, I have a boat. We're always going yeah. boating, fishing. We love the water. They introduced us to it. You know, it was on the back of the, the U project. We built a handball club with no debt. We built a full handball club with the Sport Lads U project. We went, we done full oh, racing oh, activities. Well, yeah. We done duck races. Mm. We thrown bags of ducks. We done a lot of things. Mm. 36,000 pounds we were raising two years of that. But also we would be trying to get, I suppose, get the lads to kind of see that, you know, they don't have, there's other ways of going about life as opposed to going down a, a particular slope. Like I myself, when I was 17, I stole the car, I got convicted of it and I went to prison. I would remember going down a few times down to prison to visit people and that was kind of interesting because I found, especially particularly the harder, harder lads, it was a very vulnerable time for them. And they, uh, they really appreciated someone to come and see them. We stopped at Spike Island, and there's two of the lads in there, except for one of the other girls, and we visited them. And then in the afternoon, we went on to Cork and visited one or two of the other lads up there. But um, I suppose we, didn't, we saw them as friends, we didn't see them as criminals or anything like that. I suppose we knew them socially, and. They were good people at the end of the day and went on the wrong path. At 17 I wouldn't have had no interest in walking, like I would have been happily staying since, out on the road with the lads, like, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, mucking about with them and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Doing the things we shouldn't have been doing mm. and whatever, like, you know what I mean? But yeah, I suppose I was kind of fortunate that way, you know what I mean? Mm. Just uh, coming a father so young, like. For them, very often, they're getting pregnant and having a baby was a, a chance to learn and to make that trans issue from childhood into adulthood mm. um, because very often like, they just weren't in jobs around so that, that that move into the working world wasn't available to them. Yeah. So sometimes even having a baby was nearly a career option mm. um, and it was very much to be celebrated, mm. um, you know, becoming a mother and having an identity um, mm. as a woman, as an adult um, and having somebody to care for. When this baby came along, like I was only 17 and it was like just my sister or yeah. something like yeah. you know that kind of way because mm -hmm. it's brilliant really you just brought happiness to the house yeah. as a little baby like you know what I mean yeah. and we do day outings and stuff like that and we could bring our kids with us so, like I went to Sweden on a mm -hmm. U conference mm -hmm. and I went to Spain Seville it was a another U kind of exchange mm -hmm. thing and and after been loads yeah. of places like and I was only a young age like yeah. doing all these things you know what I mean yeah. best days of my life now really like when I think back like I always kind of said it like you know good people good friends Good yeah. times, like. It was, we were very lucky, like it was something to do, somewhere to go. Because the other evenings, we used to be waiting early for the evening for our club, our night, the girls, because it's all we were doing was hanging around. And we used to do like cooking classes and things like that. And you no know, even chats about boys and about ourselves. And we had different activities going on every week. And then it got more social. So you're allowed in after school, say, for a couple of hours or whatever. It was social for us all to mix with boys and girls as well over there. You know what I mean? Which was good. Because we would have been shy, you know, as teenagers. 
it was a gateway, it was an alleyway to, to, to socially release and to go and explore yeah. and communicate and interact with people. When you went inside them doors, you were, you were the same as everybody else was in there. And I think that was the beauty of the place. No, everyone was just allowed to flourish. It's kind of thing, I suppose, that, you know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to be your best, if you like, you, there was a place where you could be mm. your best. We did this kind of really interesting exchange one time with a group in London. And they were called Fast Forward, and they, they were a youth group that worked with young people with special needs. Uh, and so they were all teenagers, but they all were either different things, Down syndrome, there was all different uh, abilities and all that kind of stuff. But it was very interesting because I mean, I remember beforehand people were saying, oh jeez, like, it, like that's a very dodgy thing to, for, for our lads who would be kind of like fairly tough to, to do an exchange with a group of young people that were special needs. And it worked brilliant. It worked fantastic. Our lads were so caring and they wouldn't leave anybody mock these lads. They wouldn't leave anybody say a bad word. And they really looked after them. And they had no problems holding hands with someone going downtown. Uh, all these kind of things which you'd say, ah, oh, you know, these lads, these are tough lads. They won't be, they won't be up to that. They were brilliant. Bringing them around to different places in Waterford and then they returned hospitality when we went to them then. And we stayed in Peckham over in Ireland for the whole weekend. And after that weekend, like there wasn't one person that went there that didn't feel a bit of sorrow or sadness leaving them behind. Yeah. Because they were such nice people, like you know what yeah. I mean? Exhibition. Oh yeah. Which um, we went to France, Saint Herblin. Which um, I did it with Stevie Conway and Bobsy O'Rourke. Yeah. But it was great. Like you know what I mean. I loved just going around, like taking the photographs. Most of the places aren't even standing now. Like you know Castle Street, and I really enjoyed it. And I took photographs in for years after. Like you know. Yeah. But I can still remember that dog, Honey was her name. My mother actually bought me that dog for her as a Christmas present. Yeah. It was my first dog, and what a dog. Yeah. Look, look there you are, a classic example. Happy out here, buy a Christmas, yeah. open the club. We all had a great ear to listen to you. Yeah. And you knew yourself when you were going in there that you were coming out of it with some sort of voice. Yeah. But you knew what to say between you, stay between you. I remember personally having my own little problem once and going to Mara and Barbara, and they were very helpful. They took time out for us to listen to us, like, you know what I mean? We just felt wanted. Yeah. That's all people want. People had issues and couldn't be dealt with at home, like, so mm. they got the help up there. A lot of people suffer with their, their nerves, you know what I mean? Yeah. And people, oh, you're mad in the head, and you're not. It's just pressure of life. It's just all your, it's all your mind, like. And if it's only someone listening to, it's not these tablets all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's answer. just someone to talk to. If you have the courage to say to someone mm -hmm. that you're not feeling okay, half the battle is won. I was in the hospital there one day. The nurse came around to me and said, what do you want for your breakfast? Pen and paper. No one said, what do you want for your breakfast? A pen and paper. I said, because if I don't get it out, I said, it's going to be gone, it's going to be, it's going to be lost forever, I won't be able to get it out. But in my dream, I was dreaming, I was writing a poem. That's why I wrote the pen and paper, I wrote it down the street and it was caught. An angel of poet who really doesn't know it, that he is a poet. An angel of honesty, an angel of truth, an angel of friendship who don't forget their roots. The street angel is always here, he always will be here to take away your troubles, to take away your fears, to feel your sorrows, to feel your tears. Sit down, kneel down by the street light, pray to the street angel, because everything will be alright. Johnny Harrigan came down to me one day and he said, there's a job fellow looking for a labourer up in Arkeen on the building site of Arkeen Hospital. 
Somebody would be interested, so no, no, about it. Some big factories opened up around the town, and I remember quite a few of them getting in quite decent jobs. Um, in the space of, I think, about a year or so, a lot of lads who had been hanging around for a number of years started to work, yeah. and that, that was the biggest shift, that was the mm. biggest change. It gave the youth of the areas the opportunity to progress into other areas. They sat people down, they went through how to, to do a proper CV. Mm -hmm. Like they went through the local papers for job mm -hmm. opportunities that were on. Mm -hmm. they, they made phone calls, they, they allowed you to use the office. So like the, the help that these people gave yeah. to the youth of the area. Well, I suppose I had to grow up in the end then. I remember the club then showed me how to go work and get work and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But John Gravy got involved with that in there and they started, we got, Put out a work experience in there, and that's how I got started in the meat factory. It changed your life. Yeah, it changed your life, yeah. Really? Working yeah, in yeah, construction yeah. since then. They deserve medals at the end of the day. I think life was simpler back then. Uh, from a teenager's point of view, I think life was hell of a lot simpler back then. It's very complex now. It's computers now, we don't want to go outside, we don't want to go out and walk up there, we don't want to go out and camp out in this place. Why would we want to camp out there? It'd be cold. The phones now and the tablet, I think people are very isolated. Mm. Just, just come straight home from school. Then throw the school bag. Throw the bag then. <laughs> whatever you do done now onto the road and you're out there all evening. Yeah. It was dark till they were called in. And, they were getting and the very same thing the next day. Yeah. They ain't been in the house, just wanted to be out, didn't it? Yeah, no one was ever in. Yeah. yeah. They would love all my phones at the time, they ring and say, we'd say, where exactly, where are you now? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You just see out this list and... Uh, listen, where the, the answer is coming back from, which direction, so you kind of know, yeah, you know, you're over the shopping centre, or they're in the valley, you know, up the lawn, you know, you know, they're 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 in the tarmac, you know, yeah. this kind of way, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could walk from one square to the other yeah. in Arsenal, mm -hmm. and by the time you get to the third square, there could be 70. Oh. It's easy to do something, be a keyboard warrior, but yes, having that, you know, and physical exercise as well. We were running around the fields and mm -hmm. doing this, that, and the other, and everything, you know, yeah. down on the Manor Lawn, the way the Manor Lawn used to be. <laughs> and now look at us. So there's a lot more pressures today than they were then. People weren't concerned if you had a Hollister top on or not. As you know, you see just several teenagers, they're they're very conscious, they're very self-conscious. It's the perfection because everything is posted on social media now. Yeah. If if you walk outside the front door, someone will take a picture and it's loaded up. There's everything from social media, it's uh, drugs are so freely available now. Mm. Uh, the attitudes the teenagers have now can be quite aggressive compared to what it was when I was younger. We're not naive enough to think 25 years ago there wasn't drugs available in the city. There was always something there. Mm. But like, uh, we're not talk, we're talking class A drugs now, uh, freely being available in the city. And that's what's frightening. The, the biggest drug that was about was cannabis maybe in the late 80s. As now if you go into the town centre, there's young fellas and young ones strung out all over the place. Drugs are so easily accessible. It's, it's actually scary. You know what I mean? Whatever about if an adult wishes to smoke a joint, completely up to himself. But it's sad when you see a kid 14 or 15 smoking a joint. That's, that's, that's a slippery pattern. The heroin has gone rampant in the town. It's so popular because there's a great buzz out of it. So if you're telling a young man drugs are bad, then he takes drugs and he has a fucking ball. He's a fucking outfit, I don't know what he's on about. These are great. So maybe it was a more honest approach with him. It is a good night. There's no fucking doubt it is. This is why they're so popular. But this is where it fucking ends. It's a roller coaster to the fucking wall. I'd like them to get involved more socially, maybe, like a club or something like that, and have the opportunities we had, getting to travel and, you know. Because they are kids going around and they have nothing to do. And, and they, yeah, absolutely yeah. nothing to do to get up the mission, you know what yeah. I mean? Try and put them in a club, or she in a club. Get them interested Not in sport. Well. Interested, yeah, in it. An interest. Like Whatever they have. Kind of sport, just get them to do something. She used to be in David Hennessy's, the stage school, David Hennessy. That's, that's how we ended up down that at Neck of the Woods. And we were collecting her from stage school one day. And uh, John Welch's uh, Water Muay Thai right. is directly under David Hennessy's. So um, my friend told me about here, so came down here and I really enjoyed it, so I stayed. Uh, she's now a uh, three-time Irish champion, European champion, international champion, and just came back from the World Championships with two bronze medals. It's a good question. Well, we in the club ourselves, we advise all the lads to stay in school. Mm. Go on to your leaving search. Go on there. But if I had to do all that, I probably wouldn't have been in the manor centre and I wouldn't have enjoyed it so much. Mm. I wouldn't have gone down that path. Yeah. I think every path has a purpose. Absolutely. You know, and I, as John F. Kennedy says, past is prologue. To trust my own instincts 
and to the people that have, were there for me mm. in the early stages in life that I felt I could trust mm. is to always remember they're there and to lean on. So the 26 year old girl, I made her stay and do her leave and like she did and now I have a 13 year old girl and my main issue to them is school. I went back to school, Alex. <laughs> I'm going to say it, stay in school for as long yeah, as you can, can, you know what I mean? Mm. Get the education, you're going to need it. You're not going to get any more fucking without it now. If you love what you're doing, it's not work. If you don't have any problems, what well, you can throw the duvet off your feet mm. and get up in the morning and do a day's work. There's yeah. nothing wrong with your life, is it? But when I left school, once I was willing to work hard, I was able to earn money and progress myself. But now if they leave school at 15 or 16, I can't see them making the ground. They're not going to be afforded the opportunities. Do things right and things will be right. And that's something I've learned later in life, you know. If you do things right in life, they seem to be right. You know what I mean? If you're living wild and erratic, everything coming back at you is a bit wild and erratic, isn't it? Get some kind of skill under your belt and take it with you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And once you have a skill under your belt like that from school, from an education point of view, and you can take it with you, you can add to it. The only person who's thinking of you, don't matter what clothes you wear and stuff, is your mother. It's hard enough living your own life, but when you have to live it for other people, then mm. you're in right trouble there, you know? Mm. That's, that's the only advice I'd give anyone, is don't give a shit. And any child's life, and any man, any young fella, young man's life, yeah. and education is what you need. And if yeah. they don't stay in school, they're not going to have the options. Mm. Stay off the Xboxes and the Playstations. Yeah. Stay away. They can really interact with life. Yeah. Stay away from drink. Yeah. Oh yeah, stay away from the booth. Yeah. Don't end up like him. And <laughs> <laughs> Just positive attitude. Mm. You know? So they have something to do. Yeah. Because you know? yeah. you've only one goal. You've yeah. only one life. You've only one mm. chance to make the most of it. Nothing is unachievable. Don't feel that you can't succeed mm. in anything in life. If like, I can't talk to nobody about yeah. that, I just want you to do There you through. go, you know what I mean? I'm after getting it out of my system, because I'm after writing it, there you go. And if mm. I feel down, I'll have you. I'll just read over, I'll have you a couple of bones, there you go. Mm. I don't want to be feeling like that again anymore, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Keep on writing and writing and writing and writing, there you go. Yeah. Remember as a kid, everything was good. Messing, playing, knocking dolly in the hood. Playing skills outside the house, knocking everyone out till your last knocked out. Camping out the front and uh, in the back, robbing hot tums, lovely cakes at that. <laughs> robbing newspapers and magazines, giving them away because we weren't mean. Taking a loan of motorbikes, never giving them back. But the insurance company will put their foot back. <laughs> I can name all the names we'll go up with then, but if we did, I'd have none left in the pen. I think of my friends who passed away, but I also believe they're with us today. They're in our house and our thoughts and our minds, a laboratory of the deepest kind.